Happy Father's Day. Hey, guys. We're glad if you're here. If you're not here, if you're joining us online, Happy Father's Day to you and our online community. If you're on the road, if you're sick, if you're watching us from states away, hey, thanks for joining us. And to my own dad, who's probably watching us right now online, Happy Father's Day. I appreciate you, love you, and I miss you. See you in July. I'm fortunate I had a good dad. I hope you had one, but if you didn't, today's message is for you as well. We are in a series, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, series that I've wanted to preach through uh, all my life as a preacher. I actually have a preaching degree. Did you even know there was such a thing as a preaching degree? Yes, I have a BA in preaching but you as a congregation have been so loving and so supportive of me over the last 11 years as your senior pastor. I just want to say I appreciate you. I love you, and I thank God every day for the opportunity I have to do this. Now, this, is not, this job is not as much fun as the 28 years I spent in youth ministry. Just want you to know. More headaches, more trials, but hey, that's life in, in leadership. Uh, today's the last day for nominations for, for leadership, I believe. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, we've got some great people that would be great leaders for our church body. And I, I just want you to know that I really love our church leadership, particularly, I mean, all the deacons, but particularly all the elders that, that I get to serve with and have served with in this great congregation. And those guys have mentored me, they've loved me, they've confronted me, they've cared for me and my family, and I would, there, there's no other men that I'd want to serve with than those men. They were just great men of God. They're doing, thank you. So, all I can do is say to you that if you aspire to leadership and God's calling you, answer that call. Because these guys are guys that you need to be under their mentorship and tutelage because they're making a difference for the kingdom of God. And even though it's not easy and, and it is challenging, I would say there's no greater, uh, what, greater opportunity to serve God in that way and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And so the congregation you're experiencing, the body of Christ, the life of Christ that you're experiencing is, is by the grace of God, but it's through leadership and and making a difference every day for the kingdom of God. So I, I just want to challenge you to do that. And that kind of goes along with what we're doing in Romans. Somebody, I mean, I've just been so encouraged by you. This is my sweet spot in preaching, is preaching through the word of God in this way. Now, do I do it all the time? No. But, but expositoring is how I've been trained, and so what I'm sharing with you in the book of Romans is how I prefer to preach, but that doesn't always go. Great art is theme and variation of that theme. So, so the Word of God, however in whatever form I preach it, is still God's Word, and it has results. It does not come back void. God's Spirit through His Word makes a difference and is life-changing. And that is where we are today in the book of Romans. We're looking at spiritual formation and transformation, and it's being formed into the image and likeness of God. And, and what that's called theologically is sanctification. It is changing and being changed into the likeness of Christ. Now, you might say, hey, you know, Chris, that really isn't working for me. Or, you know, hey, Chris, that, that is so painful. And I feel like I'm making two steps forward and three steps back. And I just want to encourage you and say, that's how it is. That's how that works. But just know, God is not through. And he is working in you and changing you to be in the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you may not realize it, but other people around you realize what God is doing. But we've got to cooperate with that work that God is doing inside of us. And that's hard sometimes. Just want you to know that. And at the same time, our internal compasses are being calibrated all the time. 
And the idea of the series is true north, and that we need to be recalibrated to true north. And sometimes, like over the last two years, we've been challenged by, by all kinds of things. And I would just encourage you to, to allow this series and, and the Word of God to calibrate you to true north, which is the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that every knee would bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and allow that will of God to work out in our, in our lives. Now, I want to just say that, did you know that we are in an information explosion era? And up to about 1993, there were only two exabytes of information out there in all of the world. Two exabytes. Now, this information explosion, you can Google it and find this all this out. Actually, now there are two exabytes of information being created every two days. That's a crazy amount of information. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by all the social media and all the information you're receiving and all the Wikipedia and the internet magic and the cloud and all that stuff, just realize that you're not alone, that every one of us. And so our minds and our lives, we can only handle so much information. And so even the stress of processing everything that we are experiencing is is stressful. And so we are what we choose to listen to and to give attention to. And we become what we listen to and give our attention to. And so I hope and it is my prayer that what we give ourselves to is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And that would take the primary role. And folks, we will be listening and hearing the voice of a different drummer. And that's what I hope Romans is doing for you. And again, I just thank you that there have been several that said, hey, you know, I really love this Roman series. And I'm just so grateful that you love the Word of God like that. And so if you will, turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 just starting out, and two starting out today. And I want you to hear this, that the first four chapters in Romans have been building a foundation, and that foundation is that Paul was called, that he loves the church at Rome, even though he'd never been there, and then he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God. And then he builds on that, and he talks about the wrath of God, and, and then how we're justified, and how how the the law is lesser than grace, but the law is still there. And then, then he talks about Abraham, and that we're all from that same lineage of Abraham, Gentiles and Jews. But guess what? It's not what we are by genealogy or by DNA, but is we are saved by grace through faith. And so Paul's saying here in Romans 5, therefore, and he's shifting gears in this moment. And he says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in Hope of the glory of God. Now, this idea of peace of God, which Paul's going to spend this whole chapter talking about the peace of God, never really resonated with me until I read Billy Graham's book, Peace with God. And and we've got to realize that we have peace with God because Jesus has done everything that is needed for our justification, just as if I had not sinned, justification, we are still being formed into the image and likeness of God, which is our sanctification, which Paul is going to talk about more in Romans. And so I want to encourage you, if you're discouraged because you don't think God's doing a good job in your life, be patient with God. He's not done with you yet. It ain't over until it's over. Peace with God is based on something God has done. 
not on how I feel. And I thought you know, the worship set today just so lended to what I'm preaching today. Our peace is built on the rock, right, Dan? And the rock doesn't move. But our feelings go up and down. And there's nothing wrong with your feelings. However you're feeling, you need to identify that and recognize that. But God's feelings about you and his stability and his security never changes. And so even in this unstable, changing world, this uh, VUCA world that we live in that's volatile and uncertain and chaotic and ambiguous. In fact, they call it a banny world, which is brittle and anxious. And I can't remember the N and the I, which is insecurity. Or, or, and and the, the N is, is that you can't even figure out what's going on. There's no cause and effect relationship that our peace is built on the rock. And, and, and recognize that we don't just have feelings of peace when we realize how strong our rock is. It's unmovable. It's unshakable. But we have actual peace because of that. And, and why? why is answered in verse 2. He says, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And what, what comfort does that give in, in our anxious and depressed culture? And I don't want to depress you by even, even going down that road. And I, I want you to ask or, or realize this, how you think God feels about you clarifies or distorts the gospel message. How you think God feels about you. Now, this is radical, folks. For some of you, you were raised in churches that were abusive, and all you heard about was the wrath of God, which I'm not going to deny the wrath. We're going to talk about the wrath of God even today, just like we did in Romans 1. But understand that God loves you like crazy. He loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you, just like David said, for God so loved the world. And But but realize, realize that there's a wrath of God for those that are far from him who continue to live lawlessly. And, and, and there is an enemy called Satan that wants to destroy you and to ruin your life. But our God wants to protect us from that. And, and we need to see today particularly, but we need to see our earthly father through the lens of our heavenly father, and not reverse that and see our heavenly father through our earthly father, but to realize that God is the perfect father. And it is not by any accident that the scripture reveals God as our father. So don't get that confused. But then Paul goes on and in verse 3, he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance. Just so you know, Paul is dealing with the reality of suffering. If any apostle suffered, in fact, Paul, when he was saved, when Ananias came to him and, and laid hands on him in Damascus, as, as we see in the book of Acts, Ananias shares this message with Paul, that God sent me to, to relieve you of your blindness so that you could come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, but also you're being called into a ministry to show how much you must suffer for God. Now, I, I want to tell you, I do not want Paul's calling. I don't want to suffer. I have not got a sadistic or masochistic bone in my body. I just don't want that. Do you? But that was Paul's calling. Here was a murderer called out by God who was persecuting the church that his life was transformed in a moment on the road to Damascus and that poor Ananias was called in Damascus to say, hey, 
There's this guy, God, God calls him out and says, there's this guy, I want you to lay hands on and pray for and give him healing. And Ananias said, hey, I've heard about that guy, God, and I don't want to, I don't want to go there. But God said, no, you go there and you pray for him. And Ananias had the privilege of baptizing Saul, who became Paul, and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Because God loved him and called him out. But at the same time, he knew he was going to suffer. That was going to be his ministry. How will we understand and believe the gospel message will be demonstrated by our attitude and perspective we have when we face suffering? But you got to understand the Apostle Paul understood that. And as he was writing the Roman church, he was saying, suffering and trials have a purpose in God's plan for my life and for your life. Now, this week has been a challenge for me. And I just want you to know that as I preach to you these type of passages that I, I don't like, I don't like, particularly like this passage. Because I know my life is going to be impacted by the passages that I preach. And I thought, oh boy, here we go, Romans 5. So I was sitting at a ball game in about 95 degree heat the other night, watching my granddaughter play softball. The game got over, and my Apple Watch just released from my, my, my wrist and fell on the concrete. It kind of did a little crunch. And I thought, man, yeah, that's, you know, most of that stuff does okay, but well, I've got a perfect crack through the middle of this Apple Watch, and there's no good way to repair it. And I didn't jump up and down and say, oh, that's great, I'm excited, thank you, thank you God for that. But but what the Apostle Paul is saying, there's going to be moments, there's going to be times in our lives where we're going to suffer innocently with just accidents that occur in your life. Have you had an accident? I had somebody in first service say, I, I just so appreciate what you're preaching today because that makes me feel better because I had a terrible week. Everything was going wrong. I was, I was in Menards on Thursday night in the plumbing section. And I don't know about you, but I hate plumbing. And I was talking to this lady who was managing the department. She didn't know anything about plumbing, but she knew where everything was. And she said to me, well, you're kind of needy. <laughs> There's no filter on this this lady. And I said, "Well, I am, and I need you to do your job." <laughs> and and I was just laughing out loud. I said, "That's just been my whole day." And I didn't bother to tell her, well, it's because I'm preaching Romans 5, and so I'm a living illustration of Romans 5 today. Because I don't run into problems and trials because I try to avoid them as much as they run into me. I had a pastor, I won't tell you which pastor I served with here in this church as a youth pastor, and he said, he said to the staff, he said, uh, hey, I want you all to pray for trials and tribulations so our faith can grow. He said that. I, and I said, respectfully, Pastor, I love you and I want to obey you, but I'm not doing that. My life is hard enough as is, and I don't need that. And I said, you go right ahead because I'll just watch from the sidelines. <laughs> and I'll pray for you to protect yourself from your own prayer. Because <laughs> you're just asking to go through a hard way. And folks... There's enough heart in life that we don't need to pray for it, ask for it. It's not going to be easy. And that's no lie. And Paul's saying that to the Roman church, but he's also saying it to you. You know, trials are going to come. Suffering's going to come. Don't go looking for it, because it will come. Look at verse 4 and 5, and he says, here's why. And endurance will produce character, and character produces Hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's provided something in, and it's the Holy Spirit. It, he, in the Greek, it's paraclete and it means helper. And, and we need to rely on Him. 
Now, I want you to know that I come from a Holy Spirit background. My, my parents are watching online. They, they believe in the Holy Spirit, and they taught me to believe in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of Christian churches, I had a Christian church uh, preacher who, who, who grew a huge church of over th- 3,000 people. And he said, you know, I neglected the Holy Spirit in my preaching. I just preached the Word. And obviously, the Holy Spirit was active and worked in his life. But he didn't understand how important it was to, to rely on that Holy Spirit to give us hope to work in our lives through those times of suffering and testing. And, and look, and, and in 1 Peter uh, 1.7, the Apostle Peter, leader in the early church, first century church, uh, main apostle, if you will, he says this, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold. How precious? More precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even though we struggle, even though we're tested in fire, we have hope that God is working. Part of that transformation formation process. Then Paul goes on in verses 6 through 8, says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we were so good, but because we were so sinful. And notice, again, he goes here in this verse 9, he's turning a corner again, and he's saying, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, just as if I had not sinned, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God is not a popular subject, and you're not going to hear a lot of preachers preach the wrath of God, but the wrath of God is real. If you're outside of Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're under the wrath of God in this life. How hard is it to live through suffering trial without a God who loves you? And eternity is at stake that there is a hell in Scripture. And God doesn't want you to go there. But He will allow you to choose that if you want. That is the wrath of God. Now what Paul is saying here is that we are saved by grace through faith. And faith is when the unexplainable meets the undeniable. God's grace is unexplainable. I had a guy ask me this week, I, 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 I'm loving to, to get to know him, this uh, Little Junior's Food Shack has just been a place where I've met young men that want to talk theology and doctrine. So I sit at the counter there, and I'm talking to this guy who's got a seminary degree, and he's searching. And so we're we're just talking doctrine. And he said, well, explain the doctrine of the Trinity. And I said, I can't. It's a mystery. But all I know is that God the Father... Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, and that's the Godhead. And it's a mystery. I don't understand it, but I have faith that God is who He says He is, and as He is revealed in Scripture, so shall it be. And that dynamic of that Trinity makes all the difference in my life and in your life. Then Paul goes on. And, and, and this is why peace is so important. Let me look at verse 10. This is for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Why is peace so important? It's because outside of Christ, we are at battle with God. And guess who's going to win? It's not you and it's not me. It's not us. But because Jesus reconciled us, we are at peace with God rather than enemies of God. Look at verse later, 
can be. It says, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That allows for peace with God. And then he turns the corner again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those sinning was not like the transgression like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Paul goes back, and he's turning the corner, and he's saying that all this suffering and trial is because of sin, because one man sinned. Now, I don't know if you've ever been mad at Adam and Eve in your life, but everything that goes wrong in this world is because of that one sin. And remember, as I preached before, that sin is a condition. It's not just an action that we take. And so we live in a sinful, fallen world, and so bad things happen to good people. And as your pastor, I watch people. I can remember in youth ministry as I was watching a a godly man suffer who worked hard all his life, who was a church leader, good guy, just had a simple faith, and he hit retirement that he'd worked so hard for. Very careful, and he didn't get in, enjoy retirement. Had a, a dementia that didn't allow him. And I'm thinking, you know, I had a talk with God. I said, God, I just don't get it. And I've seen godly women, people that have mentored and, and spiritually changed my life, go through such difficulty. And they did it with grace, and I'm thinking, why, God? Well, do innocent people suffer? Do babies die? Absolutely. It's because sin reigns and is a condition that we all experience. You see, the explanation for pain and suffering is that we all live under the curse of Adam. That's how it is. And, And it's really the doctrine of original sin. That people, good people suffer, innocent people suffer, and this is the world that we live in. But it's the reminder that there is an ultimate good. Look in verses 15 through 18, it says, But the free gift of God is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, the wrath of God, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. See, Adam brought death to everyone since his sin in the garden. Jesus brings the opportunity of life to everyone. That is an opportunity. Now, some people will take that verse that says, for all men, and they would say, see, there's no judgment. See, there's no condemnation. See, there's no wrath of God. And that's taking a verse out of context. This is not a prescription for universalism that all good dogs go to heaven. Only the good dogs that go to heaven believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus called it the narrow way. Only one way, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. You only come through the Father, through the Son. That's the only way. 
Then Paul goes on in verses 19 and 20, he says, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Now that doesn't make sense, does it? Is the law bad? No, remember, the law is not bad. The law gives us the boundary. The law shows us how sinful we are. But now the law came to increase the trespass because now we have knowledge of the law. But where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, we were under a curse, but Jesus reverses the curse and gives life. I had an old man this oh, about a week ago. He was telling me about his salvation. And, and, and he said, you know, I came to the Lord. I, I was driving a car and I confessed Christ. And he, this guy's probably in his 90s now. And uh, just shared his testimony. And, and, and I was walking away because he's one of those persons that if, if I gave him a half an hour and he wasn't done. And I just had, to, I had other things I had to do. So as I was walking away, he looked at me and he yelled out. He said, you know, because I live in Jesus Christ and I know him as Lord and Savior, he's given me more life. And I just smiled and I said, absolutely. Because the whole storyline of the Bible is about the redemption of the first Adam. It's about your redemption and my redemption. So if you're getting lost in this whole sanctification thing and and you're taking a couple steps forward, but but you're taking three steps back or five steps back, or, or you're even wondering if you're saved or not, I would say to you, don't give up. If you're breathing, God's not done. And He is working in your life. Bear under that suffering, knowing that God desires to produce character in your life and endurance. And folks, we've gone through it, haven't we? And it's not over. Because we're still alive. My question today is, do you have the peace of God in Christ are you at peace or are you still at war and last third has Jesus reversed the curse in your life he can and he will just place yourself before him Rembrandt was an artist in the 1600s and he understood he understood how sinful he was. In fact, he painted, it is called Raised with Jesus, a, a, a painting, and it and it was he painted himself as one of the soldiers that was raising Christ to crucify him because he knew that his sin crucified Christ. He also painted another painting, it was called The Prodigal Son. And he painted the prodigal kneeling at the at his father's feet and the father reaching out to him because Rembrandt felt like a prodigal. He felt far from a God and he felt estranged from the church and he knew his sinfulness. And so he could paint the prodigal, but only a prodigal could paint the loving father that received him like he did. And that's why we remember Rembrandt today. Folks, are you at peace with God? Because he wants to be at peace with you. Will you please stand as I pray? Eternal God, Father, we are so grateful for the work that you do. We're thankful for your reconciling grace that, Father, we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but because you love us so much, You're a good, good God and a good, good Father that you call us to be at peace with you through the Lordship of Jesus Christ because He's our Savior. And Father, we're thankful for the justification that we receive and also the sanctifying work that your Spirit is doing inside of us. And Father, although we may be frustrated, 
at the process because it's not going fast enough. The change isn't enough. Father, we still lay ourselves at your feet, counting on you to do that transforming work in our lives. And Father, for those that are at war with you right now, I pray that they will lay down their shield and sword. And Father, they will lay down their weapons and they will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and to be at peace with you. Father, we pray this believing and knowing. In Jesus' name, amen.